thank you, Neil. What a, a lovely introduction, and um, I am so honoured to be here today. I've been to be invited to speak here, to be invited to be an ambassador. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute, first of all, to the, the work of Neil Francis and Dr. Rodney Syme. I mean, the kind of work that you have been doing for decades is just incredible, and you speak on behalf of so many people. So, have had a round of applause for <laughs> watching the work of Dying for Dignity Victoria for many years now. And can I say, quite honestly, you are leading the discussion for change in this country with the most sensible solution, but uh, more on that later. Like many Australians, I grew up in a family where we would openly talk about voluntary euthanasia, but not in an academic way, more in a sitting around the telly at 6.30pm watching the news, there'd be a horrible story that would come on and someone would say, if I end up like that, please put me down like a dog. That's the kind of way, the kind of Aussie vernacular that we use in our family growing up. As the kids, that's me and my sister, who's three years younger, got older, the discussions became much more serious around the kitchen table and around the telly. Turn the machines off, my mother would announce at any random moment. Or put a needle, needle in my arm, I don't want to die in suffering. It became a standing joke around the house. We had a pretty black sense of humour, all of us in my family growing up. So I'd turn around and say, yeah, Mum, I'll kill you one day. In fact, I feel like killing you now. Just shut up, will you? <laughs> Everyone's mum is special, of course. And to me, my mother was a superwoman. She was a, a feisty woman. She was a feminist before her time. Oh, sorry. I always expect I'm going to get emotional. I always do. She had a wicked sense of humour, but she was also a nurturer. She was a childcare worker. She was a, a wonderful mother. She was my role model and she was my best friend. We were that cheesy kind of family who'd go on holidays together, even when we were adults. It was that kind of family. So when mum was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at the age of 51, our family was torn apart. Um, I don't know whether you know much about pancreatic cancer. Every kind of cancer is devastating, but pancreatic it kills you very quickly by the time you have the symptoms. And the symptoms are amorphous. They're things like feeling tired, putting a weight around the belly, the kind of thing that as 51 mum was kind of experiencing anyway, just put it down to middle age. She was given seven months to live. I'll never forget sitting in the oncologist's office with her and with dad. He held up this x-ray and said, you have cancer here, here and here. And it was all over her lungs, all over her internal organs that had already spread. And mum, with that black sense of humour that I mentioned earlier, said, look, I need time to digest this. I might go outside and have a smoke. No point giving up now anyway, is there? <laughs> so she went outside and had a smoke. And we talked about it as a family, about the strategy of approaching chemotherapy and radiation therapy. It was all patented by that stage, of course. Um, we went in with her to do the, the chemo treatment she made up because she was quite talented and creative with design. She made up these natty little headscarves, so she wasn't the only one who had to wear a headscarf in there. So we all wore the headscarves and called ourselves the chemo kids. We learned to, uh, to give her the injections, the warfarin, the blood thinning drug, because Dad was unable to cope with, you know, causing pain to his beloved wife. So my sister and I took lessons in doing the injections. It actually turned out to be, and I, th I think you all understand this, a lovely time, a lovely bonding time. I worked for Channel 10 in Sydney at the time, but they were very kind. They flew me up every week, so Monday and Friday I worked out of the Brisbane office and um, then flew back on the weekends to read the weekend news out of Sydney. And so I was able to live with mum and dad for most of those seven months. And dad was the primary carer, but it was so fortunate that I was able to help him, because as you know, you know, often there, there needs to be support for the carer as well. So it, it all worked incredibly well for that time. And, and it was beautiful bonding moments. You know, we had a laugh about things. We were able to talk about things uh, to a degree. And this sounds a little bit dark, but I apologise, I'm a bit dark. Um, someone suffering a terminal illness, it gives the family time to bring up those issues and talk to the loved one about stuff you might never have spoken about. So we had some incredible discussions during that time. And I learned something about cancer pain during that time, something that you're probably aware of. The drugs don't mask the pain. I always had this naive idea that morphine would fix anything, you know, just get one of these drugs and Bob's your uncle, but the searing pain breaks through. They just can't cap the pain, as you know, for all that time. 
So I had a chat to my sister, we're as thick as thieves, Suzanne and I, and we decided we'd go on the streets and score some heroin. Surely that would mask the pain. But of course, we were middle-class, suburban, 20-something kids. We had no idea where to score heroin from. We had no idea where this street was, where we could get some drugs to help Mum out. Uh, so we did. Mum wanted to die at home, but after six months, she was in too much pain, agonising pain. She was at that stage we would go to the local club and have some lunch and she'd just pass out and we'd have to get the ambulance and it was just too much pain for her to be at home. We couldn't give her the proper pain medication within the house. It was a devastating decision to have to take her to the palliative care ward at the local hospital. They were wonderful there. Um, we had a family roster where we'd sit with her so there'd always be someone there 24 hours a day just to hold her hand, mop her brow, clean her mouth out you know, get her a glass of water if she needed it, just those little things that I guess hopefully make it a little bit easier. At times she'd scream out of pain in the middle of the night, then she'd be incomprehensible. Slowly she lapsed into virtual unconsciousness. Then it got to the stage where she was unable to take herself to the toilet and I knew for mum that would be the final indignity. I was, and my father was and my sister was, we were more than happy to carry her to the toilet, but I could feel the shame in her body that she did not want to live like this. This was undignified, you know, I think it's undignified for anybody, um, but uh, my mother was quite, quite the lady. <laughs> she was a proud, almost regal woman, and I just couldn't imagine her if she was, you know, cognizant that this was happening, which she wasn't a lot of the time, but she would... I mean, who wants to live like that? Nobody wants to live like that. It was, uh, oh God, it was terrible. We spoke to the oncologist, a man of Chinese extraction, extraction by the name of Boris, which was quite incongruous. And uh, the poor man, we marched up as a family and me being quite outspoken, I said, look, I read about these cases where you can help someone along. Can you help my mother with her suffering? And he was a lovely man, but Look, like probably 50% of doctors, I don't know what the percentage is, a lot of them believe in voluntary euthanasia, but they're unable to do it. And he said, no, I, I can't do it. I can't help you let your mother die in a dignified, compassionate way. He said, unless you find a nurse who will do it. So, of course, then we did a straw poll of all the nurses. <laughs> you know, we'd get them into a private area, just in case anyone overheard it and there might have been legal action. And they all said, look, they all said, I wish that we could, but we simply cannot under the law as it is at the moment. And it just didn't make any sense to me. Because I've read all the polls that 80-something percent of people in this country believe in voluntary euthanasia. And yet families are left to watch their loved one die in suffering. The medical profession, many of them support it as well. And yet they cannot do it for fear of ending up in jail. It didn't make sense to me then, and it doesn't make sense to me now. As a family, had we made this compact, this understanding, to ensure that none of us dies in suffering, that we can die peacefully in the presence of loved ones? I could not see why, uh, in a compassionate country, um, in a democratic country, in a secular country, I could not see why we could not be allowed to do this. So I started doing some reading, sitting on the couch next to mum. Every night, on those long and harrowing nights, I read about euthanasia and I got very, very angry. All this rubbish about, you know, what if someone knocks off their parents to get the money in the will? Goodness me, they can do that now. You know, all this, um, the religious argument, it's against the law of God. Well, I would say, what kind of God wants his or her people to end their lives in suffering, in agonising pain? I'm not going to go too much into the politics of this or the, relig uh, the religious arguments because everyone comes at it from their own point of view. I just want to share my story with you. And there are plenty more people who are plenty more educated about this than I am, like these gentlemen on my left. But from my understanding, physician-assisted dying has not been widely abused in the countries where it exists. The appropriate safeguards are in place in places like the Netherlands, like Belgium, like Oregon in the United States. And every survey done in Australia repeatedly shows that the vast majority of Australians believe that we need a law to enable end-of-life choices for those who request it. So after reading all of this material, 
I made my decision. Mum had been pretty much unconscious at this stage for weeks now, occasionally screaming out in pain in the middle of the night, but that was it. We were unable to communicate with her any longer. This is no way to live, I thought. I'd just read a story in part of my reading material about a woman who'd suffocated her mother with a pillow. She said it was the best gift she had ever given. And so I thought, this is what I must do. So I picked up the pillow I was sitting on, and I walked over to Mum with the pillow. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, that time when everything just seems too much. You think, this woman, she cannot live like this. And I had the pillow in my hand, and I held it over her head, and I thought, this is the right thing to do. But I could not put that pillow on her face. And there were many reasons for that. I thought, you know, is this my decision to take? I knew that Mum would have wanted it. I knew that my father would have wanted this to have been done. He said that to me subsequently. My sister wanted it. I wanted it. So most importantly, the patient and the immediate family wanted this to happen. But I just couldn't do it. And I don't know whether it was, to this day, a lack of courage. There was also floating around in my mind you know, Dad is technically her next of kin. They had a beautiful relationship, Mum and Dad, and am I taking that decision away from him, even though I knew that he wouldn't have the courage to make that decision either? You know, perhaps I should give him the chance to say goodbye, or my sister the chance to say goodbye. All these things were floating around in my mind. And whatever was the overwhelming reason, I simply couldn't do it. So I sat down and I cried. I felt so cowardly. And yet I thought, it's just not the right decision for my father. So I went home, I finished, uh, I guess, my shift at 6 o'clock in the morning and Dad took over and I vowed that that night I'd talk to Dad about this moment. But I went home to sleep and three hours later, Dad came home and woke me up and said, Mum's gone. And so my sister and Dad and I sat with Mum and she was at peace. It was actually a lovely time sitting there with Mum's body, holding her hand, you know, rubbing her brow and thinking, she is actually not in pain anymore. And being so relieved that she was able to pass on. I've spoken to Dad about this subsequently, and he said, yes, it would have been, he wouldn't have been angry if I had have put the pillow over Mum's face, it would have been the right decision. But at that moment, and you know what it's like with the immediate families? You're very close, but you're so busy on this roster of caring for the loved one that you don't actually sit down and say, OK, Dad, if I put a pillow over Mum's face tonight, will you be happy about that? It's just not that kind of decision. But it's such a difficult discussion to have with the way the law is at the moment. You don't feel like you can have these open discussions about something that is quite, I think, would have been quite a compassionate thing to do. That was 12 years ago. About four years ago, I read another story about voluntary euthanasia in the newspaper, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Why are we still having this discussion in this country and nothing has been done? So I wrote an opinion piece about it for the Daily Telegraph in Sydney. I had no idea about the impact that one article of 900 words would have. I received, well, first of all, it was supposed to be an opinion piece <laughs> on page 12 or page 13, wherever they're normally situated. I worked the next morning, and I was working on Sky News, so I worked at 4 o'clock, and there was my picture on the front of the paper. It took up the entire front of the paper, and I was um, delighted that this issue was getting such um, voluminous coverage. But it was also a little awkward on Sky News that morning because we do what's in the papers, and I had to hold up the Daily Telegraph with my own photo on the front of it. That was a little weird. In the subsequent hours and days and weeks, I received hundreds of letters and emails from people in similar circumstances, these courageous people who wrote emails telling about their stories. I'll never forget the phone call I got from a young farm boy, I guess young, he did his 20s, and he said his grandfather asked him to shoot him because he was in misery. And this boy said to me, I didn't have the courage to do it. And my grandfather died in pain months later. And he said, I wish I had had the courage to do that, you know? Uh, other stories, people emailed to me um, and sent letters anonymously, which is understandable because of the law in this country, saying that they were courageous enough to be able to help out their loved one. And 
They wish they could tell their story, they wish they could tell people, but they just don't feel comfortable to do it. The stories were heartbreaking, I mean, absolutely heartbreaking. And um, after the publication of that uh, article, my sister called me and told me something she'd never told me before. She said, I tried too. I said, what on earth are you talking about? She said, a couple of nights before you tried with the pillow, or you thought about trying with the pillow, she said, when I was there on my shift, I pressed the morphine button, the self-administering morphine button that the nurse was coming in to press. And she said, I pressed it so many times my thumb went red. And she said, I pressed it, I pressed it, I pressed it again. And, sorry. I'm so proud of her, actually, for trying and for not speaking about that for all those years until I wrote that article. And I thought, these are the disparate things that ordinary Australians do every day of the week. Because our lawmakers do not have the courage of their convictions to address what is a basic human right, the right to die. So because they don't have the courage, every one of us has to sneak around doing this and feel guilty about doing this every day of the week. It's just appalling. With an ageing population, there will undoubtedly be more stories of cruelty to our fellow man, families riven by heartbreak, unnecessary, needless suffering. And so, from the bottom of my heart, the heart of a still grieving daughter, one of many children, parents, aunts, uncles and grandparents who are faced with this most invidious situation, I thank you, the members of Dying with Dignity Victoria, for your life-changing work. We were speaking about this over lunch today, but, uh, that I hope to live to see the day when we have right to die legislation in this country and the day when we start treating human beings with the same compassion that we seem to reserve for animals. Thank you for your work and thank you for listening to my story.